How many interface do you expect? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that question means. So you might have to clarify, if you can clarify, or does the, um, does anyone want to clarify verbally what that might mean? No, okay, have a think about it, and if you can think of another way to say it, let me know, I don't quite get the question. There's only, you know, you've only got to propose one kind of prototype, uh, one, uh, in your proposal document, you've only got to propose one system. And in the second assignment, you're going to um, prepare a bunch of prototypes, four or five different prototypes, depending how many people are in your group. But they'll all be basically addressing the same, uh, the same issues. They'll be uh, prototypes of the same concept. Um, would someone mind closing that, dragging the table and closing the door? I, I do it myself, but I'm just tied to the computer by about 50 different cables. Actually, guys, when you come in, would you mind just um, dragging that out of the way and closing the door? Pardon? Uh, I don't really mind whether it's in or out, but just as long as the door can close, because the noise comes through. Thanks. And now, does the door close? You just, I don't know if it will do it automatically or not. It automatically opens. Okay. Okay, so I did, uh, apologies um, for this week. I did sort of change the topic um, a bit at the last minute. So uh, we, I was going to be talking this week about images and processing. So apologies if you read up a bunch on images. Um, I need to sort of be bitterly disappointed that today I'm talking about data visualizations instead. But we will do images next week. So I'm not sort of deleting images. We're just not we're going to do data visualization this week instead. Because this semester is the first time we've really done data visualizations as a potential assignment topic, and I thought it would be worth spending a bit of time on it now um, uh, before we uh, get, get sort of too much down the track. OK, so has anyone ever come across this book before? The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. So this is an awesome book. If, you, if you're into visualizing data and telling stories with, um, with graphs and telling stories sort of with interactive visualizations on a computer, this is a, a real, it's a classic book and every kind of lecture or talk you go to about data visualization will refer to this pretty much guaranteed. Um, so it's a really beautiful looking book and it just shows you a whole bunch of examples of different kinds of ways of visualizing data. So it's kind of not focused on computers. It's more just focused on graphic design and how you link a, a visual graph or a visual um, sketch or something like that to um, a bunch of data to tell a story and convey the meaning of the data in some way. If I could just also remind everyone just um, to, if you need to talk, that's cool, but please go outside and talk because some people want to hear. And um, if you're constantly talking, it's very distracting for them, and it's also distracting for me. Yeah. Okay. So when you're talking about talking, when you're talking about um, making data visible in some way, sooner or later you've also got to talk about integrity because it's very easy to misrepresent data if you if you link it to, to visuals in inappropriate ways. So I could have a look at this graphic here, for example. And tell me, why do you think this might be misleading? Have it, maybe just take, take 30 seconds. You can talk to your neighbors if you want to uh, run it by them. You know, I want to have a stab at why that might be misleading. It might not necessarily be misleading, but I'm just saying it might be. Between this one and this one, there's like 10 difference, roughly. Yeah. And between this one, there's also 10. 
20, but it seems like the difference is the same. Yeah? So I'm not sure if I totally agree with you. I'm not sure if the, what you're saying is the scale of the difference between this big red bar and this medium sized yellow bar is um, not that you're sort of using the same scale as the difference between the green one and the orange one, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, you might be right. I'm not saying you're not. Um, so, but that certainly, if that's true, then it certainly would be misleading. So, applying a different scale to different bars on the graph would definitely be misleading. Yep. Yes, they're comparing data from different periods of time. So, what would what would be likely to change, say, between 1992, 2001 to 2013, 2022? Inflation would change, so probably the value of the dollar is maybe half what it was back in 1992. Yep, so. What does the actual actually mean? There's two of them. It doesn't say where the dark what that actually means. doesn't say what that actually means. Yep, so another good um, principle for doing your data uh, visualizations is make sure that you cite the sources of your data and clarify what terms mean. So if you're going to put something like this in here, Make sure somewhere or other you say, by actual we mean this. I think what they probably mean in that case is that that's actual money spent by the government, whereas this is what Obama's um, government was planning to spend in the budget. I'm assuming, but yes, but he's, the, your point is still valid. What else would change between 1992, 2001 to 2013, 2022? Revenue. Revenue. Yeah. The amount of money coming in would probably probably increase if taxes and everything else stay the same. If just because of inflation, the amount of dollars coming in would increase. Yep. <laughs> Debt would probably change and affect spending as well. Yep. Yep. All good points. Is there anything else that would change? There's one other thing I can think of that would obviously change. <coughs> Population is what I was thinking. <laughs> So the amount of money that you spend, if you're counting just raw dollars, maybe it'd be better to count something like dollars per head of population, because if the population is increased by, I don't know, 30 million or whatever, then the amount of money the government would be spending is likely to increase, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's you know, an increase in real terms or an actual increase per head of population. So when you're doing this kind of data visualization stuff, it's very easy to mislead. <laughs> um, and so you need to think, and sometimes people do that deliberately and sometimes accidentally, often accidentally. Have another, speaking about integrity and problems, this maybe is a bit hard to see, but can you see this middle one here? Can you see it, read it well enough just to kind of get the gist of what's going on there? This is the, it's the net income slash loss of a mine, I think it's a mining company in one of the annual reports. Can, if you, can you see it well enough to actually make sense of it? Yeah, okay. So can you see what, what, what might be misleading about that? Uh-huh. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if I'm looking at the same, you might not be able to, are you talking about this one here, this middle graph? Oh, I see, yep. So, yeah, in a way, there are three separate graphs, and you're right, the, the y-axis here, the scale is dramatically different for each one. Just, just focusing on this middle one for now, though, forget about the ones on the side here. This net income loss, what's particularly misleading about that one? <laughs> oh. The first column takes Yes, exactly. So this first column is actually a negative value, so it's actually a loss of 11... I guess that would be $11 million, or probably not 11000 but um, so it's a net loss. So, and so if you do the calculation, what it means is that down the bottom here, that you would think will be zero, is actually like negative something or other. <laughs> so they're basically, by cleverly um, scaling the y-axis, they're trying to make it look like 1970 wasn't actually as bad as it really was. <laughs> So scaling the, the data on the y-axis is a very common 
uh, problem. And here's an, a, a dramatic illustration of that. So if you glanced at this and said, oh, we did a survey to find out whether um, messing around with the data on the y-axis was misleading or not, and this is the graphic that illustrates what we found, you would be thinking, oh, yeah, well, it's pretty much 50-50 split. Some people thought it was misleading to mess around with the y-axis, and some people thought it wasn't. But then if you look at the actual y-axis, the bottom line is 98%. So 99% think it's misleading, and 1% think it's not misleading. Yeah, so a very obviously manipulated example. But um, yeah, it, brings, it brings, home the, brings home the point, I guess. Um, another thing to, to keep aware of when you're doing this kind of data visualization stuff is confusing correlation and causation. And this was such a kind of crazy example that I couldn't resist putting it in. Um, but can people tell me what I mean by correlation versus causation? What's, what's, so what I'm showing here is a graph of, uh, what's this? The blue line is the murders in the United States, number of murders in the United States, and the green bars are the Internet Explorer market share. And you notice they're exactly, well, they, they're you know, obviously the same sort of shape. So we could pretty much say almost for sure that Internet Explorer was causing murder and if we can stamp it out entirely, then we will have a murder rate of zero, right? <laughs> so no, clearly that's not the case. So you've got to be careful about, you, you can tell sort of silly stories with data just as easily as you can kind of tell meaningful stories. So be aware of that. Okay, so there's a bunch of places you can acquire data. So for your assignment, if you choose to, you can um, do a uh, data visualization of either the data from Building 11's sort of uh, sensing systems or from the United States election. Um, and you could get, if you're going to do the United States election, you could get lots of data from lots of different places, government websites. If you guys could just be quiet up the back because it's getting really tedious. <laughs> um, government websites, Twitter feeds, um, surveys, sensors from buildings, all that kind of stuff. There's data all around us. And with the Internet of Things kind of getting more and more of a big um, buzzword and a big thing that's happening, um, there's more and more data that you can tap into more, more easily. Um, and when you do that, you're going to need somehow or other in your processing sketch, tying this back to the very concrete issue of coding, if you're going to get access to that data, you're going to need to somehow get it into your processing sketch and mess around with it so that you can um, visualize it or link it to sound or, or other stuff like that. Um, and if you're talking about big, long lists of numbers, usually you're talking about, in, in, in processing terms, you're talking about messing around with arrays. Um, just kind of quick show of hands, those of you that are, know about arrays and know what they're for. Okay, those that don't know about arrays. Okay, good, those that don't care. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so pretty much seems like most people know about arrays or they don't care. So if you don't care, that's fine. Um, so maybe I won't spend a lot of time on arrays. I did also, in the pre-reading, I think I sent you a link to those, the videos by uh, Daniel Schiffman. He does a very good job of explaining arrays. So if you are a bit rusty on it or you're not sort of comfortable with it, um, spend half an hour or so checking out those, um, those uh, videos there. And you, yeah, that, they will help. Um, so I guess these slides are really just saying that arrays make it easier to work with big long lists of numbers. The syntax looks something like this. You have a variable name followed by square brackets and you declare the size of the array normally when you initialize it. And from then on you can access each, each um, element of the array by using the number inside the square brackets. Or of course you can do something like this, use a for loop to um, work your way through all the elements of the array one at a time and do something to them or uh, you know display uh, display some kind of uh, something on your on the screen uh, as a result of the value of that array element and if you if you're unsure you can either watch the Daniel Schiffman videos or you can see chapter 5 in the book because that also does explain arrays if you uh, need to refresh um, now one thing I'm going to say um, is that the map function in processing 
is super, super useful. Remember this, doesn't, pretty much doesn't matter which project you're doing, I can almost guarantee 99% sure that MAP will save you a lot of pain. So let me give you a quick example of what MAP does and you might thank me for it. Um, it would certainly be nice if, if you did. Uh, so often what you're doing in your code is you're getting some bit of data coming in and that bit of data is going to have a, a numerical value um, in some range. So it might be from 0 to 100, or it might be from 0 to 255, or it might be from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000, or, or whatever. But you often kind of pretty much know that the data coming in is going to be in a certain range. Like, for example, if, the connect, if you're using the Connect camera, it, it might be giving you the, um, the X coordinate of your right hand, and you know that's going to be between 0 and 640, because that's sort of the width of the Connect window. I think, or 320, I forget. But you know it's going to be between 0 and some number, which I think is 640. Um, and what you often need to do is take that range, of that number that's going to be in that particular range, and map it to something that's on your screen, which maybe is using a completely different, um, uh, a, a different sort of range of numbers. So maybe your screen is only 100 pixels across, and you want your hand to move um, you know, across the screen when you, with, uh, with your gesture from the Kinect. So you've got to somehow map that data that's coming in from 0 to 640 to, from 0 to 100. And you could do some maths and you could figure out, okay, well, in that case, we multiply it by, you know, 1 sixth or something like that. That should kind of give us roughly the right kind of range. And in that case, it's not too tricky to figure out what the maths should be, but sometimes it can be a lot trickier. Um, and if you remember that you can use the map um, function, you don't even have to worry about that maths. So what map does is you pass in uh, five parameters. First of all, you pass in uh, the value that you want to um, scale between. The, yeah, you pass in the value you want to scale. Then the first pair of numbers is the lower and the upper range of the incoming data stream. So in the case of the Kinect 0640, And then the second pair of numbers is the range that you want the value to be scaled to. So if I wanted to scale from, if I knew my data was going to be coming in between 0 and 640, and I wanted to scale it from, to between 0 and 1, so that 640 would map to 1 and 0 would map to 0, my, my incoming parameters will be 0, 640, 0, 1. Does that kind of make sense? I'm not completely convinced I'd understand my own explanation. So what we're doing here... Well, let me run it. I'll show you what we're doing here, and then I'll come back to the map. So what I'm doing here is scaling our mouse x parameter. So you should remember that mouse x is basically the x coordinate of the mouse cursor in relation to our window. So when it's all, over all the way over here, our mouse x is 0. And when it's all the way over here, our mouse x is 640, oh, sorry, 639, because we're going from 0 to 6, 640 pixels wide. So if we count 0, we've actually got 640 pixels there. So our greatest mouse x value is 639. But for some reason, uh, in my app, I need to scale it to I need to scale my x parameter to be between zero and one. Maybe I'm just scaling the size of a rectangle or something like that, and the size of that rectangle is going to be one centimeter wide or something. So I need to tell the map function to expect mouse x parameter as the input, zero as the lowest value of the input the width of the screen minus 1 as the maximum value that input is going to be, and then 0 and 1 to be the minimum and maximum of the output value. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's amazing how often you need to do this kind of thing. 
If I wanted to say, for example, instead of scaling from 0 to 1 as my output parameter, I'll, I wanted to scale from minus 1 to plus 1, I could do that easily just by changing that um, output range. And then we're now seeing that 0 uh, mouse x scales to minus 1. And 639 mouse x scales to 1. And somewhere in the middle, at 320, I guess, we should be close to zero. Okay, so it makes make sense? Useful? Okay, good. Any questions? Very, very useful utility method. Don't forget that it's there. It will save you a lot of dodgy maths. Some other practical information about processing and data. You're often going to be getting your data in different formats depending where you're getting it from. Commonly, you get data in um, like CSV values, comma separated values. Um, that's a very common way to get a bunch of data. And in a lab, you'll be accessing some data in that format. Um, and I th I'm pretty sure the data from building 11 the weather, uh, not weather, building 11 sensor systems, I think most of that's available in CSV format. Um, so it's quite easy to get that into processing. And I'll show you how to do that in a sec. I won't show you, but it is also very fairly easy to get it um, into processing if, if the data is coming in in XML format or in JSON format. So both of them are quite common formats, probably not as common as CSV, but still very common. Um, and both of them are supported by processing. And if you do want to mess around with data in those formats, then again, Daniel Schiffman has some very good videos that take you through the mechanics of, um, of doing that. It, but it's quite straightforward. There's really not a hell of a lot of code to it. So if you're working with CSV data, you would use this uh, built-in processing method called load strings. Um, and you just give it the, the file name of uh, which contains the comma-separated values. And if you read the chapter, you would have sort of already seen this, but I'll quickly show you uh, what I'm talking about. So this is um, some data, which is a, a, apparently all the Apple, Apple stock, stock price information. And as you can see, it's a bunch of data, and all the, the numbers are separated by commas. That's why it's called comma-separated values. So I, th I forget what all the data is. Obviously, this is the year. This one here is the year. I think there's, this is probably the month or something like that. Um, and this is various um, stock prices, I guess, and maybe how many, how many, how many shares have traded. So it's very common to get data in that kind of format. And if you want to load it into processing, it's pretty straightforward to do that. You use the load strings method, and that will return you um, an array of strings containing. Uh, basically, there's one. Each element of the array will be one line in your text file, and then you need to go through each one of those lines and split um, and get each number between the commas. So you use this. Um, split method, again built into processing, and tell it to kind of break up the data into individual chunks, um, which is separated by commas. Uh, so that's comma separated values and loading it into processing. And if you want to display the data, Um, you can do that too. Um, so there's a simple processing sketch which basically works its way through each element of the array, plots a, um, a vertex on the graph 
on the screen at the appropriate point based on the value of the stock that it's just loaded from that uh, CSV file. And, um, and then, yeah, and, 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 so, and so it puts a vertex there and then connects all those vert vertices up and that produces your graph. So I think you could probably see here how the map function will be useful because you're going to be scaling the stock value, which is going to be coming in between, it looks like about 192 and 322. And you'll be going to be scaling that to fit onto your graphic screen at the appropriate point. So that's a good example of where you might use that map function, for example. Um, are there any questions about that? Uh, what is, oh yeah, good point. Very clever programming on my part. Yeah, no, I have no idea. Okay. Broken projector, but I'm not sure which one will be broken. It's got lines on my screen here, so I guess that one's probably the broken one. I imagine the one on the left has got um, the high uh, brightness. If, if you have a look at the, um, the title bar on that window, it was also way too white. Oh, okay, right. So, so it's probably got some funny contrast or brightness setting or something on the projector. That's probably true. Um, that's why we have two, I suppose. I know never really knew why. Um, so accessing data in comma-separated values is, is pretty easy in processing. Um, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on it. I think you would all get the code quite quickly from just looking at it in the, in the lab. Uh, I will also point out that if you're dealing with Tab tabular data, so if you're dealing with data like the sort of data you would be storing in a spreadsheet or in a, in a database, something like this, for example, which has got a bunch of information about uh, various kinds of bolts and things like that, um, sometimes it might make sense to use the table class which processing provides. Um, so what you can do is actually load in that CSV data into a table class instead. Um, and then you can kind of deal with the data as a series of rows and columns, which sometimes makes more intuitive sense. So um, I guess what the advantage would be is that um, if you know, if you're reading in the CSV values, you have to kind of know that column number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is number in stock. So if you want to load in the number of stock, you've got to remember that you could to ask to get kind of value number eight out of uh, each row of data. Whereas if you load it into the table uh, class, you can actually say, you could ask for um, number in stock by name. So if we, if we go back to our, our Apple example uh, here, uh, let me show you what I mean. In this example, I've just changed the CSV values, the CSV file. Actually, I didn't mean to load it in Excel. Let me just load it in text editor again. You can see I've just modified this CSV file slightly. And on the very first line, instead of actually providing data, I'm providing information that describes the name of each column. So the first column here is the month, second column is the day of the month, third column is the year, fourth column is the low stock price for that day, then the high stock price, the closing stock price, and the volume of shares that are sold. So in the first line, I'm actually describing the name of each column of the data that's in it. And if I do that, and if I use that table object, instead of uh, that, uh, the other method I used before, the load, load strings. If instead I use load table and use the table object to store the data, then what I can do is when I need to get the closing price of the stock, I can use a bit of code like this to say, oh yeah, get me the float value that is in the column that's labeled close, the closing price of the stock for that day which is a more intuitive way of sort of asking for it than say, give me the, the float value in column seven. 
So it's usually easier if you're dealing with more complicated data with many, many columns in the table. That's usually a much less error prone way of doing it than asking by number. So I just flagged that for you as another sort of useful tip for writing more maintainable and, and more reliable code. So if you're working with tabular data, take a look at the table object in processing. Um, that code, by the way, does exactly the same thing, I think. It just draws the same graph. I oh, know, slightly more sophisticated. But basically, the point of it was to show you that you could use the table object instead of the, uh, just the rays. Any questions about that before I press on? Okay, so there's a bunch of different kinds of visualizations that you can use. Um, the ones we've just been looking at a, a time series, that is the one axis, usually the, the x-axis is showing um, the progress of time. So in this case, we're showing uh, each month uh, as across the x-axis. But you can also show lots of other kinds of visualizations, like for example, maps. Has anyone ever seen this one before in other classes? It's, okay, some people have. Okay, can you explain what it is? Or can you remember what it is, or you're not quite, not sure? It, it shows um, the cholera deaths in England um, or in London, and it shows how they're related to uh, the sewage system in France, the, the connection to the sewage system. Exactly, yep. So, yeah, in, back in 1850 something or other, 1851, sorry, 1854, there was an outbreak of cholera in London, and um, John Snow uh, did this very famous visualization of where the deaths were occurring, and he plotted it on a map, and he also marked the various pumps, like the water pumps that people used to get their drinking water from. He marked them on the map, and what he saw is, P marks the maps here, and this one, this black mark here, that's another, that's the infected pump. But that wasn't until they sort of looked at this kind of map with this kind of information plotted on it that they could really see this pattern becoming apparent. And when you see it laid out like this, you can, it becomes quite clear. Well, maybe not. It's, uh, it becomes uh, clear that there's something going on in that area um, and quite likely related to the pumps. Um, so it's a, a very sort of classic example of how visualizing data in a spatial kind of way, like on a map, can help to give you insights into what's going on in the situation. Here's another uh, very interesting one, kind of very confronting and heartbreaking one. I don't know if you can see it so well, but has anyone seen this one before as well? Probably the same class. Because do you remember what it was? Probably your interface design. Uh, no, I didn't do this in no, interface no, design. One, when I saw it oh, okay. Uh, Yes. Yeah. It does. It shows a number of things, actually. That's what makes it sort of so interesting. So, this is the march of Napoleon's army into Russia. So they marched into to Moscow over here. This is them. This sort of orangey coloured uh, line here is the soldiers marching into Moscow, and the black line is them coming back. And the width of the line is the number of soldiers. So you can say they start off with, uh, well, I can't, it's too small for me to see how many, but they start off with a you know, very large army in the hundreds of thousands, probably. And as they march, more and more uh, soldiers are killed or die. As they get, to, and they get to Moscow, then they turn around and come back again. And you can see the line getting thinner and thinner until they return all the way back with an absolutely very minuscule fraction of the number of soldiers remaining compared to what they left with. So it tells a pretty confronting and, and horrible story. And what is, what is also shown on this visualization, again, it's very hard to see, but I'll try and zoom in. This is the temperature down here. So zero is here. And this is for the return trip. I think this, is, this shows the temperature in relation to their return. Because when they, they, they left in June or something, which is the Northern Hemisphere summer, and they came back in, um, well, during winter anyway, although going into winter. 
And so it started off being zero here. And then as they get further along here, your temperatures are starting to drop down to minus 21, minus 11 there, minus 20, minus 24, minus 30. So hardcore cold temperatures. <laughs> um, and you can see all this, see other interesting things like when they cross this river here. You can see the, the number of soldiers about halved crossing that river. So obviously there's some, some horrible event happened there that caused a lot of people to die, either of uh, cold or you know, drowned or something like this. Um, so it's a very um, sophisticated and um, powerful visualization of, um, of what's going on there. So yeah, so maps are very uh, commonly used to, uh, to view data and obviously now with computers you can have interactive maps as well, so you're not just displaying fixed information on a piece of paper but you can make things interactive. Uh, I'll show you an example. This is by Ben Fry, one of the developers of processing. I'm not going to show you the code because, oops. Oh man. <laughs> okay. Why? Apologies, I must have somehow... Oh, I know what my problem is. It's the old open it in processing 2 problem. Oh, you have to close processing 3. Oh, yeah, okay, thanks. This time for sure. So a lot of the examples are very US centric tonight. This wasn't deliberate, it's just that's where a lot of the, um, the good data visualizations are. Um, so this is a, a United States postcode or zip code explorer. And if you type in the digits of a zip code, if I type in a nine, it shows you all the zip codes with a nine as the first digit. And then nine two, all the zip codes with a two as the second number. And then I'm just typing in random numbers here, one, three. And you can see as you, as you go, you can see how each number relates to the location in the United States. So I get from this, I think the reason Ben Fry did it is to try and figure out what the postcodes actually mean. So he knew that the first digit, you know, meant certain states. And then from doing this visualization, he could figure out what the second digit meant, what the third digit meant. Um, so again, a good example of how an interactive visualization can help you to perceive patterns in data that you weren't sort of, aware, you wouldn't be aware of just from looking at say a huge table of postcodes, you would not be able to perceive those patterns. Um, other things you can do include heat maps, and in the chapter five of the book, the, they go into some detail about how to do that, but essentially you're taking um, data and mapping it to color. Um, so the example in the book is of uh, numbers that people pick um, and showing you how, which if you ask people to pick a number between zero and 100, they almost, uh, they will very frequently pick 17. Apparently that's the most common number to pick between zero and 100. Um, and by doing a heat map, you can sort of make the most popular numbers that people pick um, very, very apparent. Um, other things you can use heat maps for, this is eye gaze data. Um, so people who are doing human computer interaction or are trying to figure out what users um, are attracted to in an interface or on a web page or something, sometimes use heat maps, sometimes use eye tracking systems to track the movement of um, people's eyes. 
And this is an, um, a heat map showing where, I'm not sure how many people, say 100 people, where their, eye, where their gaze tended to go when they looked at this um, advertisement or web page or whatever it is. So you can see, you know, most people look at the, the, fa the baby's face. And um, so this kind of visualization can make some kind of patterns very, very apparent. So if you're going to be using processing to do a visualization, the chances are you're going to want to make your visualization interactive. So just showing a still image is not really using processing to its best advantage. The whole the whole strength of it is that it can make things interactive and people can manipulate data to sort of see it in their own particular way. They can follow their own interests or they can um, generate their own insights using your tool. So if you want some guidelines for how to go about this, um, Ben Schneiderman is a very uh, well-known researcher in human-computer interaction. And way back in 1996, he developed this sort of basic um, approach to um, doing interactive data visualizations. Um, he said, first of all, you should provide an overview of the entire collection, just like Ben Fry did in that postcode visualization. We sort of saw all the postcodes across the entire map of the United States. You should be able to zoom in on items of interest. So you see the, everything, and then when you're using it, you kind of go, oh, that's interesting. Let me look at that. So you should be able to zoom in on the item of interest and drill down. You should be able to filter out the uninteresting items. So if you're interested in some particular part of the United States, you're going to want to filter in, be able to filter out all the rest of the data from the rest of the country and only focus on the bit you are interested in. Um, and when you need to, when you want to get the details, like when you want to get the low-level data, you should, that should be available on demand. So for example, um, I don't think Ben Fry's visualization actually did this, but I should maybe be able to click on an actual city or something on the map and it would bring up the postcode information for that city. So I could get, all, I could get the low-level data if I wanted it by, by selecting what I was interested in. So overview, zoom, filter, details on demand. You should be able to relate, uh, view, like view relationships among items. Um, often, in the case of the postcodes, maybe the, rela the relationships are that Cities which are geographically close have similar postcodes, so they're related, and your visualization should make that relationship apparent. Yep. Um, you should also keep a history of actions to support undo. So if, you're, if you've got a more complicated visualizations where you're drilling down to lots of different kinds of data, um, you might, you, sometimes you want to kind of zoom in for a while, but then you want to back out again in order to take a different path, so you should be able to do that. And finally, you should be allowed to uh, extract sub-collections um, of the details when needed. So here's another good example of an interactive data visualization which kind of follows most of those principles. So this is meteorite um, strikes on Earth. So this is very quite hard to see, but this is this actually is a map of Earth, and it wasn't that there were no meteorite strikes back in 1400 or 1500. It's just that we didn't record them. <laughs> um, so you can sort of see as we get closer to the present day, the kind of the map showing like the land masses of, of Earth um, becomes more visible um, through the actual data. So what I can do here is I can drag to say select a region of interest. So that filters out all the stuff that, I'm, that is outside of that region of interest. So I say, yeah, I'm only interested in you know, this range between about, I don't know, 1980 and, and 2002. So don't give me all this stuff back here or up in the more recent times. Um, so I can filter that out and I can zoom in on regions of interest and I can see, um, well, I can also see like how big some of these meteorites are. When I do a mouse over, it tells me the details of um, you know, what type of meteorite it was, what it was, the meteorite was made of, how much it weighed, what year it fell, all that kind of thing. And I can see relationships in that the, the, the meteorites which hit, um, oops, didn't mean to do that zoom. The meteorites which hit, diff um, 
same countries or whatever are grouped together geographically. So I can see relationships, I can filter things out, and I can drill down and get the details when I need to. So it's a good example of a nice, um, I was going to say simple interactive visualization. It's kind of deceptively simple, it's conceptually simple, and it's easy to use. But to actually make something like this would, be, would take a fair bit of effort, a lot of trial and error and, and coding to make it really work effectively. I think I already showed the dumpster in like one of the earlier lectures. So this is another good one. I won't show it now because we're getting out of time. But if you remember, it showed um, a bunch of romantic breakups that, where people documented the breakup on a blog. This was back when blogs, people actually had blogs. Um, and you could kind of apply the same kinds of principles actually as that meteorite one I just showed. You could see all the breakups sort of in a big overview here. You could zoom in on the ones you're interested in and you could drill down and get right to the detail of particular breakups by clicking on them. And it also made relationships between them apparent because the breakups which were kind of similar, which where they used sort of similar keywords, were, were shown physically close together in the display here. So again, using a lot of the same principles that we just articulated. Um, there's another good example there in the, as you can check out, but I maybe won't go into it now, just showing the Again, it's very US-centric, unfortunately, but um, they're looking at the budgets of various, I think it's university or high school basketball teams in America, and trying to predict, based on what the budgets of those basketball teams are, how, how successful they'll be in the actual uh, matches. And they were reasonably successful, actually. Um, I'll very briefly talk about, Ben Fry has some good principles as well. So if, you, if you're doing your assignment on the data visualizations, you should check out Ben Fry's book. It's available for free on the library website. This is the visualizing data. Um, he goes into a lot, he gives you a lot of good information and he uses lots of examples in processing. So it's quite a good source. So if you are going to be using data visualization, I recommend you check that out. But he gives three, three basic principles. The first is that each data visualization project is unique. So you can't, while there might be some good general sort of guidelines to apply, it's not the case you can take a, a, a universal visualization tool and apply it to every situation and have it work effectively. He says sometimes um, less detail can convey, convey more information. And he also says that you need to know your audience. So this is partly why we're sort of doing, well, we're doing quick and dirty uh, user uh, investigations by basically using our imagination to create scenarios and prototypes, but you need to think about who's going to be using your visualization and keep them in mind while you're designing it. Um, if you want to access Twitter, uh, I think some of you have been talking about using Twitter in your assignment. You can do that using the Twitter 4J library. That works in processing, so you can get Twitter feeds into your visualizations. And there's a bunch of other sources of data. I mean, I'm just giving you a, a few here to, to give you ideas. If you're looking at the US election, you know, news sites could be a good source of data. And a lot of the big ones, like the New York Times, the Guardian, and so on, have uh, APIs that you can get access to so you can visualize news. And you can sort of do search for particular keywords, like presidential, um, president, uh, pre presidential candidate names, stuff like that. Um, the two books, uh, well, sorry, there's a book I'd recommend, and a, um, that's Ben Fry's one. I'd also recommend that uh, book I showed at the beginning, the Tuft book um, about visualizations. That's such a classic, it's really worth a look. Um, and there's also some um, useful videos on lynda.com uh, called Interactive Data Visualization with Processing, which, again, if that's going to be your assignment, you would probably want to take a look at. Um, but it's not so relevant if, you're, if that's not your assignment. OK, um, are there any questions that uh, you have? OK, where is the link that you upload the lectures? It's on UTS Online. You go to UTS Online, I think it's subject information, and then there's a lecture folder and a lab folder. The lectures are all in there. Um, are there any other questions before we wrap up? No? OK, then I'll see you in the class. Where are all the main memes? What's that? Where are all the memes? There are only 12 questions. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, your lack of memes is disturbing. Yeah. Oh.